Do you consider yourself the greatest player of all mm. time? That was a good question. Do I consider myself the greatest Pokemon player of all time? Honestly, I'm Ray Rizzo, and I'm from New Jersey. As a kid, I used to be really into sports. I was super into soccer, ice hockey, basketball. But at the same time, I was super into games in general. And like everybody in my generation, Pokemon came out. It was just this huge thing. And the kids would bring their Game Boys and Link cables to the elementary school, be trading Pokemon on the playground, seeing it get advertised on TV and watching the anime and everything. I honestly can't even state enough just how much of a phenomenon it was in the U.S. back then. I'll trade you this for a Gyarados. Henry, that for my Gyarados? Gyarados? That's crazy. I first got into it with the originals Red and Blue. I was only like five years old, so I remember struggling to go through like Mount Moon, and it was just such a unique kind of game for me. In fact, there were eight different gym badges, so many different Pokemon to try and collect, and you could battle with them. I had never played a game that had that level of depth, but uh, that was kind of what got me into the game in the first place. Then I slowly got older, got into high school, and Gen 4, Diamond and Pearl, they hadn't been released yet in the US, but they had gotten released in Japan. And as I was then learning about Diamond and Pearl games, I found Smogon, which got me kind of more into the competitive style of Pokemon, which was at the time still single battles only. But that was when I first saw the Journey Across America tournaments, results, videos, and what Smogon called war stories, which were just people's stories about attending the events and their results and everything. And so reading about you know some of these players competing in real events, winning prizes, the prestige that comes along with it. But the 10th anniversary party and the 2006 Pokemon video game national championships begin. Start the game, brothers! And all of that together just got me really motivated. And eventually they announced for Pokemon Battle Revolution that there was going to be these in-person tournaments at all the game stops around the country where you could compete and win the new game for free. So I entered one of those GameStop tournaments, easily won my free copy of Battle Revolution, but uh, I didn't even have a Wii at the time, but just competing in that kind of in-person tournament was just super cool to me, and it made me getting really into competitive Pokemon from there. So competitive Pokemon, it went by video game showdown. So VGS was what we used to call it. This was the first time that we would have regional level tournaments across America that would then funnel into a world championship, which at the time was only America and Japan. So the regionals at that time were lottery based. And so not even everybody who wanted to play could get to play. Now I was fortunate enough in 2008 at the New York regional I was allowed to play that year, and it was my first year, first attempt at playing competitively. I was still kind of a noob, but I had been strategizing for double battles. Uh, I had followed on YouTube some of the tournaments that would take place in Japan and see what they used to win their tournaments. And so I came into it with a Trick Room team, Bronzong and Level 1 Smeargle, with a Belly Drum Snorlax and Psych Up Metagross in the back. So it was just a ripoff of what the Japanese national champion the year prior had won with. I was able to win my rounds pretty convincingly. It was like best of one, single elimination. You couldn't afford to just get even the slightest bit unlucky because losing a single battle and you're just completely done. You would just play whoever was like standing in line next to you and then when you won a round, you would then be put into a line again and then whoever else finished at like the same time, you would just play them. So it was very different from, you know, the polished version it is today. But I was able to make it all the way to the top eight before eventually losing. And that was luckily good enough to qualify me for the World Championship that year where I won an entire free flight and hotel stay 
to Florida to compete against the Japanese players. And I was only like 15 at the time, so I was still super young. But it was really cool to actually go to a world championship. It was still best of one single elimination in round one. Almost every single American player matched up against a Japanese player. And the tournament just became essentially <laughs> Japanese nationals. And that's where we really got to see just how far ahead Japan was. So that really motivated me to taking VGC seriously, which almost um, ended immediately the year after. In 2009, they still had the lottery, but in this year, there was so much more interest in competitive Pokemon. And so rather than there being like 150 people showing up at the New York Regional, instead it would be like 500 people showing up and only 128 getting to play. And so you really couldn't justify like flying to events to just hope that your 20% chance of winning the lottery to get to play actually occurs. So I had my one shot at the New Jersey Regional and I did not win the lottery. So I didn't even get a chance to play. Luckily in 2010, they kind of realized that the lottery is a mistake and so they did away with it. So I attended our regional in New Jersey. I fought my way through each round, eventually making it into what they called the finalist lounge. They had like a section with a bunch of bean bags where you would just wait there and you could talk to all the other players who made it that far. And then from that point, you would play one more round, which would then determine, did you get the invite to US nationals? And it, the entire tournament from start all the way to finish up till the finals, every single game was single elimination, best of one. But I was able to get the invite to nationals. And for the first time, we had Swiss rounds. Which means that every trainer will play every round. Which was excellent because it does minimize how much luck is involved because you can afford to lose, you know, one, two games. So I played through the Swiss rounds, did well enough to make it into the top cut where I then competed the next day in the top cut single elimination stage of the tournament, where unfortunately I had finished in the top 16, uh, which was a single round away from winning the free flight to go to Hawaii for Worlds that year. And I was just a high school student back then, I was 17, so I didn't have the money to go fly to Hawaii. And I was super fortunate because my family was really supportive. They saw how into competing I was. So they helped me afford my flight to Hawaii and allowed me to stay in the same hotel room as just total strangers who I had been talking to online. So I'm absolutely grateful for everything that they've done. <music> 2010 Worlds being in Hawaii just made it feel so much crazier to me. They had this gigantic resort rented out and there was so much Pokemon memorabilia, Pikachu costumes, inflatable balls in the pools that you would throw around and stuff. It was just a really cool experience. So my goal going into the 2010 World Championship was just prove to myself like, okay, I've improved in those last two years, much better player. And because how dominant Japan was at 2008 World Championships, and then seeing them dominate again at the 2009 World Championships, I really studied and followed what was happening in Japan, which at the time was insanely difficult. Just tried to find as much information as I could, searching Google, searching YouTube, and eventually I found a website where somebody would post the results of the Japanese tournaments. Back then, uh, they actually had tons of events that you could go to in person to compete. And so I'd be following those websites, Google translating all these ridiculous translations, trying to guess like, oh my God, what move is this? Some of the translations were just God awful, but at least could get an idea of what the metagame was in Japan at a certain time. And so I used that when making my world championship team where I had trick room team with Cresselia, Kyogre, Groudon, Ludicolo, Dialga, and Hariyama. So very trick room oriented, but I still had that Ludicolo, which in rain could be insanely fast. And I will say one big difference back then, which doesn't exist now, was you didn't actually have to register your held items to an individual Pokemon. You could change around your items. So one round you could have Groudon hold like the iron ball, but then maybe another round could give ground on life orb. So that was a very unique way of playing the best of threes. Having that kind of flexibility on the team as well made a huge difference. And so I was super confident with my play throughout the event, but didn't have the expectations of actually making it to the finals. He is a challenger. 
representing the nation of the United States. In the finals, I remember feeling like I was an underdog. The guy I was up against had a really good Swiss record. He did great in Japan Nationals, and he beat me the day before in those Swiss rounds. I was just so nervous. This was my first time ever being in the finals. The bright light stage, everybody watching, playing against somebody who was just at a level above what I was capable of. I was thinking super hard about, okay, what's my strategy here? And I believe I found what was the best strategy, which was leading Groudon and Cresselia, try and get Trick Room up. But I ended up just totally misplaying because I, for whatever reason, completely forgot that I could be switching around items. And so I kept the Iron Ball on Groudon, even though I had no need for it because he didn't have any Pokemon that were slow enough where the Groudon actually needed the Iron Ball. Like I could have just given it Life Orb and some of his Pokemon just barely survived where if I just gave it Life Orb, they would have just fainted and I would have had an easy win. That match, I was almost kind of blacked out. Like I had no idea like what I was doing. I just misplayed and kind of got bailed out a few turns. There were so many critical hits and misses and you know, I got pretty lucky. I'll totally admit that. When it came down to that last turn where I knew like, okay, I'm about to become world champion. So many different thoughts were going through my head. I just couldn't even believe it. As soon as I got off the stage and checked my phone, it was like my friends from high school who didn't even know I liked Pokemon had already known like I was the champion because it was like all over Facebook. My parents were texting me like, oh my God, we saw you won, congrats. And all these things that are going through my mind. I'm getting like scholarship prize money. I'm going to Japan. Just all of it's going through my head and the entire experience winning Worlds that year was just something else. It was indescribable really. In 2011, I already had my invite guaranteed to the World Championship that year. So I actually did still attend regionals just to hang out with the friends that I made because I was still super into competing at Pokemon. Even though I had won the year before, like my motivation did not sink at all. If anything, it was even higher because just the way my finals match went down, I just felt like, wow, I misplayed. I could have done way better. And also the team building aspect, I had just used a team that was super heavily inspired by Japan. Like it wasn't my own team building creativity or anything that led to me winning. So my goals going into that year, build a very creative yet really effective team. And then also of course, defend my title because I wanted to prove to everybody who was maybe doubting like, ah, oh, he only won because of luck. I wanted to prove like, okay, this year he won because of skill. I wasn't entering regionals to win or qualify for Worlds. I wanted to at least bring a team that could test out some of the ideas that I had for what I might eventually bring to Worlds later in the year. And that was when Wolf first burst onto the scene and seeing how he plays and the teams he's building, and I'm super impressed by it. Even though this is his first year, I'm seeing somebody who could potentially be like the player I would have to worry about most in tournaments. And ultimately I proved to be right because he dominated at regionals, dominated at nationals. He was pretty clearly the biggest threat at the tournaments I was attending, that was for sure. So for Worlds 2011, Pokemon I was using were just deemed crazy. 
Stuff like Gossetelk was deemed completely useless by almost everybody else. Back then it didn't get shadow tags, so uh, you know, you were using Frisk, which was almost useless. That was one of the main cornerstones of my team because of the sole reason that it was faster than max speed Amoongus. Other things like my super bulky Conkeldur, which at the time, you know, nobody was using that way. Everybody was using Guts, super offensive Flame Orb Conkeldur, and here I was using an extremely bulky Conkeldur with no leftovers, really bulky substitute Hydreigon. That was another thing just nobody was using, bulky Thunderous, which again, at the time, everybody thought of Thunderous as just this offensive Pokemon. I saw Thunderous and I was like, well, Prankster, that seems like a totally busted ability, and it gets Thunder Wave, which at the time was even better than it is now because it was not only 100% accurate, but you could cut speed to a quarter and you could thunder wave other electric types. And I thought that was the single biggest reason I did really well up until the finals. finals of 2011. I was super low stress, not worried about it at all. I think that experience being in the finals the year before absolutely helped. I felt pretty good about my matchup. I was familiar with what my opponent was using because I already had played against that exact team in the Swiss rounds of the tournament. So when it came time for the actual finals, like I thought I played totally on point. You know, mentally I was sharp. I didn't feel like I was misplaying at all like I was the year before. I won game one pretty easily, but game two, I just got totally unlucky and, and lost purely due to luck. I think if that would have happened in 2010, that might have just like ruined me. It's easy to kind of crumble from not only the pressure of being on stage, but then when you actually get unlucky and get forced to play a game three when you should have just won the match 2-0, you know, without too much stress, that can also just cause you to crumble if you're not totally prepared mentally. But because I have that experience from 2010, I didn't let the bad luck phase me. I knew I had a good matchup and I would win if, you know, I didn't get unlucky. And so, you know, I took the loss, went into game three. Here's Acrobatics. Most likely straight through the flying gym and is indeed, and that is going to hit. Wow, Ray's from Boston. He's holding in there an amazingly good development for Ray. Great response in time. Yeah, I knew if I just stayed calm, played my game, I could win game three. And that's what ended up happening. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a two time world champion, Ray Rizzo! As soon as I won Worlds, I saw the group of my friends rushing on stage and they lifted me up and had the American flag. And that was super cool. I'll never forget that experience. 2011, I honestly felt even better after winning than I did in 2010. I thought I built a great team and I thought I piloted it really well. It also proved to, if there were any doubters of me and my skill, I was able to then prove to them like, okay, I'm for real. Maybe I won my finals match last year due to luck, well, this year I won due to skill. At this point, having won back-to-back -back worlds, I actually, for the first time, kind of lost motivation competing in Pokemon because I was just like, well, what more is there for me to achieve? I won worlds back-to-back. -back. Nobody's ever done that before. I improved myself in exactly the areas that I wanted to improve. What more really is there? And so I kind of took the year off. And because of winning worlds in 2010 and 2011, uh, I won free trips to Japan for a group of four, but I wasn't able to actually go to Japan until 2012. So the first time I took my family, you know, I owe them a ton 
for getting me to where I am. It's like I really wanted to take them. And then about a month after that was when I took a group of friends that I had made from Pokemon. And so then we were able to actually connect with all of the local Japanese players, going to like one of the local tournaments, getting to meet all the players. It was just such a cool experience for me. That single-handedly just motivated me to try and win Worlds again. Welcome to the 2012 Pokemon World Championships. Heading into Worlds, I only had two months practice and looking at the metagame in the US, in Europe, it just seemed like it just paled in comparison to what was being used in Japan. So I decided to again take a lot of inspiration from the Japanese metagame. I went in with a Cresselia, Metagross, Tyranitar, Rotom, Garchomp, Hydreigon, just some of the strongest Pokemon available. My strategy was I'm just gonna play better than everybody and I ended up executing on that. So going into the finals in 2012, I am matched up against Wolf, my biggest competitive threat at the time. There really couldn't have been a better script being written that year. I had beaten him in top eight in 2011. I'm gonna lose to anybody. Wolf is as good as it gets for me to pass the crown over to. Even though it was Wolf, I wasn't really super nervous about it. Again, I had the experience from 2010, 2011 finals. So we're starting off with close combat. Right. In, oh, wow, critical hit That's to start uh, the match, and Metagross goes down. Even on turn one, Wolf got like a double critical hit against me with both his Pokemon. And even despite that, I still won the game. So heading into game two after that, I was just like, oh man, if Wolf is going to get that lucky and I'm still going to be able to win just on the power of just how solid my team is, then uh, I'm just feeling really good. And I, I believe that Metagross's ability is that he includes being immune to flinch, right? To clear body? I believe so. <laughs> Watching it back, I mean, the commentary that was being delivered is pretty comical. Definitely very different from what we have nowadays. And we just saw Cresselia taking weak damage against a fighting type attack. Fighting types are uh, do, attacks do not do well against Psychic-type Pokemon. Right. Wolf uh, close combated at Cresselia. The nerves maybe got to him, but honestly, I don't know if it would have mattered too much. I had Choppleberry on Tyranitar. I just felt like totally in control that game, and that was my match against Wolf in the finals. Winning the third world championship in a row, I would say that one probably didn't feel as good as 2011, uh, just because 2011 I felt like I went into the year at the very beginning with a clear set of goals and I worked the entire year to achieve them. Whereas 2012, I really only started two months before Worlds. Even though my results that year were actually better than any other year, like I'd gone totally undefeated, I feel like I didn't work nearly as hard to win that third year. But it did still feel amazing getting to actually be put in the game. I would be the champion of the in-game tournament that they'd arrange. That would have been something as a kid I would have loved to have happen. And so that was by far just the coolest thing. Why have you won three years in a row? What makes Ray Rizzo the Pokemon genius? I'd say it's a mix of different things. I was in that kind of age range where you have not very many responsibilities, but a lot of free time. And so I could spend a lot of time dedicated to actually practicing and playing a lot of games. There was a lot I feel like I learned just watching Japanese players play. And I was also very critical 
of myself. Even though I won Worlds, I felt like, man, my team building could have been better. I wasn't just settling. I felt like that kind of hunger, that desire, and that critical analysis of myself also really helped. Are you gonna miss your old Pokemon? Yeah, they, they fought the good fight last year. They're getting a nice rest. I'd like to thank them for their time last year, but this year I'm going with some new guys. So heading into 2013, it just kind of felt like I had done everything. And my goal at that point was like, okay, I'm just gonna win worlds with just the jankiest Pokemon possible. Am I actually good enough to win worlds a fourth time in a row with intentionally using something stupid? I'm now here with Ray Rizzo, who I now unfortunately have to call former world champion. What is that like? I wasn't. Torkoal was just that bad, uh, especially without drought. But I really, really enjoyed just being in the stands and cheering for Aaron. His match against Ryosuke, I mean, I must have lost my voice. I was shouting so much. I was so into it. He's going to try for another Will-O-Wisp. Will it hit? No, of course not. <laughs> of course Rotom is not going to hit with that Will-O-Wisp. It was really nice actually getting to cheer for a friend that year. I got a sudden surge of motivation. So what you're telling me is that Ray Rizzo will be back. Ray Rizzo will be back next year. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the 2014 Pokemon Video Game National Championships. With the release of X and Y, and after losing the previous year, I think it'll be a great story if I can just make a comeback and, and win Worlds again, and so I was super into competing that year. We have, coming up onto the stage, Adib Alam, perennial Nationals competitor, and none other than three-time world champion Ray Rizzo. I was on top of my game. I was playing as well as I had ever played. I was building teams as good as I had ever built. And I was just super motivated to, you know, really do well in this kind of comeback year. Ben had a fantastic year. He won two regionals in spite of not playing at all in the fall regional season. So Ray's had a great year. He's looking like he's gonna have a great nationals. This is the one level of tournament he's never won. And I'm on stream for one round. And, you know, after I win, my friends are telling me, Dude, Ray, all these people are talking about you. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And they're explaining to me like, oh, Aegis Slash is in a dream ball, that's not allowed. The person who I trusted for my US Nationals team that year had traded me a dream ball Aegis Slash. Aegis Slash couldn't be caught in a dream ball naturally in that generation. I didn't know that it was in a dream ball. It was bred totally legit and everything passed the hack checks. I thought everything was fine, but because the parent was hacked and was in a dream ball, that just passed down to this baby Aegis Slash. And so a lot of people for whatever reason got incredibly angry. There were people who took it like way too seriously. Some people would send me like death threat messages. I think that happened, that was one of the factors where it just felt like, uh, is it even worth it? It's just unfortunate that it kind of gave me that reputation when up to that point I was motivated just to make like the comeback story because I thought that would, you know, be pretty hype. But it just kind of lost my motivation to really compete at a high level, attending tournaments and whatnot. And while I might not have been as into competing at that point in my life. I still liked going to the main events and seeing friends who I might only get to see two times a year. It was just a nice chance to get to see all these people I've met throughout the years and become close friends with. And so that's kind of what the events became for me. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 2016 Pokemon National Championships. My name is Evan Latt, and I am joined by the one, the only, three-time world champion, Ray Rizzo, at the desk to kick everything off. So starting in 2016, they started adding casters. And so that was when I took it upon myself to kind of reach out and see if there was any kind of opening for me to join the casting team. And fortunately, there was. Hey guys, Aaron Cybertron Zeng here, and today I'm joined by my good friend, 
Ray Rizzo. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it, and so just watching all the battles with no real stake in, in what's going on, not spending time grinding games on online simulators or on in-game ladders was a nice change of pace. Uh, now Xerneas, it's staring down a Scizor, which does fantastically against Xerneas. And so it was really nice to still be involved with the game and still kind of offer something to the community and hopefully, you know, create an interesting and entertaining broadcast. So in 2019, I was at a stage in my life where I had been working for a few years, living in the suburbs, have a nice job that's paying pretty well. It's what the American dream is, but I'm thinking I want to try something that I had always wanted to do, which was move to Japan. It's a place I had visited maybe like eight, nine times just as a tourist or through Pokemon. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go for it. I really only plan to go over there just for a year. but. After a year, I ended up just loving it in Japan. The amount I've grown as a person, the kind of experiences I've gotten to have here, and just the quality of life. Honestly, it's probably one of the best decisions I've made. And I would have never gotten involved with Pokemon. I never would have been interested in moving to Japan. It's just incredible to think that a children's video game that I played when I was five years old has just shaped my way the way that it has now that I'm in my 30s. It's just crazy to, to even think about. I go from just this shy, unconfident, nerdy kid in high school who's unpopular, going from that to then winning worlds, and then that triggers a bunch of fans, and now I'm talking to a bunch of fans, being on stage in front of so many people watching, doing interviews, and then TPCI flew me out to an event in Japan to go on stage during Tokyo Game Show. So I'm doing all of these things that are giving me you know, experiences I never even dreamed of. The friends that I've made that I never would have met otherwise. Met Aaron Zeng back when I was like 15. 15 years later, we've gone on trips together. We've met each other in foreign countries. The friends that I've made and gotten to know over the years have changed my life a lot. I would just love to see competitive Pokemon just continue to grow and grow and grow because the franchise has honestly done so much for me. I just want that kind of same experience to pass down to others in today's generation of hungry competitive players. I would love to see them having these same kind of experiences that I got to enjoy because Pokemon has so drastically changed my life. I would love to see Pokemon continue to change other young people's lives. Do I consider myself the greatest Pokemon player of all time? Honestly, I think I'd have to. And there's always debate on is the greatest a player from a generation before or is it whoever the best current day player is. To me, part of it is that until somebody wins Worlds a second time, still have to consider myself the best. But if somebody wins a second World Championship, then that starts a debate and Honestly, I think that would also motivate me to make a bit of a comeback because now suddenly there's some competition for who the greatest of all time is.